welcome. Welcome everyone um, to the panelists and to the moderator and to all you participants coming from almost 50 countries. And um, we have a wide range of people with us today. We have our NGOs um, and we also have academia, cities, governments, health, media, police and transport with us. So this is really in the spirit of, um, of these uh, alliance sessions that we would like to bring in as many people as possible from different, um, different sectors. Uh, during the, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, we had some member calls uh, with our 240 members in 90 countries. And we asked about their challenges and how they were coping. And one of the things that we're, we're mentioning was um, how they had seen a strong uh, appreciation of uh, a responsive health system. And um, they have also seen a lot of other things. They have seen cleaner air, less, um, less uh, uh, cars on the roads, things that, um, that a lot of other groups are also advocating for and um, changes that we have in our road safety communities actually also advocated for for a long time. And that spurred us to start these sessions where we are trying to bring in uh, specialists from different fields, not just from our road safety field, but also from uh, other fields, to talk about a range of uh, areas. And uh, the first ones uh, we had a couple of weeks back on urban planning. Uh, last two weeks ago, we had one on on mobility and today we have on health systems. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Corinne uh, from East, who is our moderator today. Uh, and welcome to you and welcome to our um, all our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you Lottie. Um, so hello to everybody and welcome to this session on health systems and COVID-19. Um, as Lotte said, my name is Corin, and I work for the Eastern Alliance for Safe and Sustainable Transport, which is more commonly known as EAST. Um, by way of just a brief introduction to EAST, um, we are a regional network of local road safety NGOs working across Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the Caucasus and Southeast Europe. Um, our mission is to make road, road travel safer greener and more sustainable for future generations and we, we do this um, primarily by building local capacity in the region and delivering projects in line with the, the five pillars of the Global Road Safety Action Plan. Um, in 2014 to specifically address issues around Pillar 5 we were part of a group that co-founded an organization called Fire Aid and International Development and these days fire aid is working to build resilience of emergency services globally to respond to road traffic crashes and improve post-crash response as well as other emergencies um i've shared just about to share a link um in the chat about to fire aid in case you want to find out a bit more about our work in this area um but Moving on to, to the topic of today's session, um, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as you're probably all very well aware, has exposed the fragility of our health systems in almost every country around the world. Um, more than a quarter of the world's population has now experienced some level of lockdown, and this has caused economic chaos globally, but the alternative would have been a total collapse of healthcare systems around the world and just an unprecedented loss of life, um, more so than we can probably currently even envisage um, today. So the pandemic has made a lot of people a lot more aware now of the importance of robust and resilient healthcare systems. Um, and it has put the issue very high on the political agenda. So today we are going to talk about what this means for us in the road safety community. Um, first and foremost, better healthcare systems will mean an improved capacity for post-crash response and trauma care. And if put into place effectively, this could in itself reduce the number of road fatalities by up to 50%. And this is why Pillar 5 of the Global Road Safety Action Plan is so vital. However, there are going to be challenges, um, as most countries are now beginning to shift their focus on rebuilding their economies and starting to open up and lift lockdown measures. 
how can we encourage the governments and the major donors to keep focus on this area, particularly in low and middle income countries where resources are limited and where there are going to be many competing demands for investment? Um, can we, as a road safety community, do more to collaborate with healthcare professionals to achieve this mission? Um, uh, these are some of the questions that we're going to be putting to our panelists today. And just a quick introduction to each of them. We've got Olive Kubusinye, um, Senior Research Fellow, heading up the Trauma, Injury and Disability Project in the School of Public Health at Makere University in Uganda. We've got Dr. Priyanka Relan, uh, Technical Officer for COVID-19, um, the COVID-19 Health Systems and Service Response Team and the COVID-19 Medical Clinical Management Response Team at the World Health Organization. And we've got Erkin Chechibayev, who's a former Minister of Health in the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, just an, a bit of an explanation of how the session will work. Um, to begin with, each speaker will give a very short uh, presentation, introducing themselves and discussing their professional background, their experiences of the pandemic, any lessons learned and how they may see things changing as a result of the pandemic. Um, I will then put to each of them a few specific questions before opening up to questions from the participants. Um, I've got a selection here that came, that was submitted in advance, uh, but when the time comes, please also feel free to post questions in the chat feature at the side. Um, but if you do post a question, please make sure you post it to the all panelists and attendees. Um, so everybody can see it. Um, so, so moving on, um, Olive, would you care to begin and tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Sure, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've just introduced, my name is Olive Kobsinji. Um, I'm an accident and emergency surgeon and an injury epidemiologist. Um, I work as a senior research fellow at Makere University School of Public Health. Um, I'm also a distinguished fellow of the um, of the George the Global Institute uh, for Health, uh, and I also chair the board of the Road Traffic Injury Research Network, uh, which is an international agency that uh, focuses on researching road safety in middle-income countries. So my initial training um, and, and actually the work that I did for more than a decade was uh, working as a surgeon in the accident and emergency department where I really spent my days um, doing more than 50% of on road traffic crashes. Um, and then I moved on from that and uh, was busy with my registries, um, learning how to deal with injury surveillance uh, in general, not just looking at road traffic. And then I transited into um, public health where currently I research road safety amongst other things. Um, and I also work with the Road Traffic Injury Research Network to try and uh, improve road safety through research in low and middle income countries. So coming to the pandemic, uh, so initially, when it was um, declared a pandemic, those of us that were not in uh, infectious diseases initially didn't actually think we had a big role, but it very quickly uh, then unraveled to, to the point where it was obvious that it wasn't just infectious disease, um, that especially with the lockdown, that it was all of health. In Uganda, we've been in lockdown now. This is uh, week seven. Uh, but even from very early on, it became obvious that uh, care, accessing care, any sort of health care was going to be critical. Uh, lockdown um, came before there were any deaths. And even up to now, curiously, Uganda doesn't have any deaths from COVID-19. But it has lots of deaths in communities from people that cannot access care for whatever reason, mainly because they don't have transportation, there's a curfew going on. Um, and so other problems started to become more important. And so my involvement um, in this pandemic has been on two main fronts. 
on advocating for and trying to push to make sure that there's access, access to health services, that people that don't have COVID can actually access care and that health workers will be protected. So I'm, I'm working with two different committees on both of those areas. And what we've realized is that initially, because as Corinne just said, this was before COVID-19, any crisis of any sort, our healthcare system was really fragile, was really fragile. In 2018, we conducted a national survey on emergency medical services, and we looked at all six pillars. So we looked at leadership and governance, we looked at financing emergency medical services, we looked at data that would advise on the administration of these services, we looked at the health workforce, at services delivery, and at medicines and products. And in all those areas, there were huge gaps. So coming into the pandemic, I knew, I was very aware that those gaps were going to now be glaring, and in fact, that's what what has happened. So this is what we're currently dealing with, uh, trying to survive um, the lockdown and to ensure that people can access healthcare. Um, if urgent rushes have actually reduced, great need there is for emergency medical services uh, is, is just so obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Olive. Very, very useful. Um, We'll return with some, some questions in just a minute. Um, Priyanka, would you like to introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your experience? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. <laughs> um, sorry, it seems my computer is having some issues. Um, so as, uh, as Corinne said, my name is Priyanka. Um, I'm a, currently a technical officer at the uh, headquarters and World Health Organization in Geneva. Um, my background is uh, in clinical emergency medicine. Um, I did um, training in a couple of years in trauma surgery specifically, and then, um, and then further on to clinical emergency medicine. Um, and my training was also in public health and with a focus on um, injury epidemiology and uh, working specifically on burn injuries and registries. Um, and then I, I spent a couple of years at um, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and learning outbreak epidemiology in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, and now at uh, WHO, started off in, again, in the global surgery um, program and continuing forward into the emergency trauma and acute care program. Um, and that program is, um, has been the sort of the uh, the secretariat or the, or the lead in the working group for Pillar 5. Um, so I've been involved with the UNRSC um, coordination and I've recognized some names from, from the attendees from the UNRSC group, as well as uh, the Global Alliance for Care of the Injured, um, which is another uh, network of or a professional organizations that uh, the WHO is a secretariat for. Um, so it's really a, a pleasure to be here um, and to talk with you about health systems and road safety, um, and, partic and particularly putting it all into context of COVID. Um, as part of the COVID response, um, WHO, for the first time in our activation of the incident management structure or the, or the, um, the emergency response structure, which happened on January 1st after the, after the first announcement or the first uh, notification that we had about a cluster of cases from Wuhan on December 31st. So January 1st, we activated the incident management structure. And um, the, for the first time, we have a health systems and services pillar right within the, the, um, the structure of the response. And that is, not, that, is, that is something new for us. And it's very exciting to be part of that pillar. And, um, and with our unit um, that was previously the emergency trauma and acute care, is now sort of covering all of clinical care. Um, so starting from the entire spectrum of, of clinical management, um, from pre-hospital care to emergency care, critical care, surgical care, uh, palliative care, and linking to rehabilitation. So it really covers this whole continuum of, a, of a, how a patient may access the system um, through to how, um, how they may be going to rehabilitation if needed after severe injury or severe, uh, severe manifestation of COVID, and, and then going back to home. 
Um, so, uh, so I've, in, in my role in that, I've also been working with the clinical management team as part of the incident management structure for COVID. Um, so it's really, really been a, um, a special time, a very unique time at the organization. Uh, to, and indeed, um, there's been lots of activity, lots of discussions from countries and, and regions and asking for con uh, consideration about how to keep our essential services going during this time. Um, and, you know, everyone sort of, and initially, in the lesson that has been learned since the Ebola outbreak in 2014, uh, where all of the focus really went to caring for Ebola patients and preventing Ebola in the patients who didn't have it, and just everything went to focus of Ebola, and there were actually significantly more deaths from all of the other things that didn't get addressed because everyone was focused on Ebola. So from, from injury inclus inclusive, HIV, TB, malaria, and several other diseases that uh, that just didn't get the attention. Um, so learning from those lessons, uh, you know, was one of the reasons, one of the of the instigating factors for us to have this pillar within the incident management structure. And and so our our role in that in that in the health systems group has been to ensure that countries and um, and partners are aware that there are all of the other other services that need to continue on during this time. And how can we support? the countries and organizations to ensure that all these other essential services keep going in the time of COVID. And that, um, that is really uh, well, well dis, you know, the discussed amongst our, our groups and amongst our um, partners. And we have some guidance that is out there that is uh, speaking directly to that. And I'm happy to talk more about that um, as this discussion continues forward. Um, and really, we have some, some really great um, ideas and some lessons learned from countries and, and, uh, and partners and how to support uh, ongoing work, including trauma care and injury care. So looking forward to discussing more. Thanks, Bianca. That's very good. Um, Erkin, can you tell us a bit about yourself? yourself? Hello. Uh, my name is Erkin Chichebaev. Uh, I am a public health doctor. Uh, first, my education was as a sanitary hygiene doctor here in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, then I uh, did my master in health promotion and education in Maastricht University. Uh, started work uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan as health policy analyst first, then uh, has an experience working in uh, WHO headquarters in Geneva in health promotion unit. Uh, and the uh, last uh, couple of years, I was working as a Deputy Minister of Health of Kyrgyzstan uh, and uh, decided to change my work towards uh, actually road safety. Just before COVID outbreak, I had resigned. Uh, so this is my short background. Uh, I think if you have any questions, we can move ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Erkin. Okay, so we'll jump straight into um, some of the questions. Um, we start with Olive. Um, so through, through your work, you have an excellent understanding of how the health system works um, across all sort of facets and what the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, from a wider public perspective, the pandemic has made us all much more aware of some of the, these issues and equalities, um, the glaring gaps, as, as you put it, um, is also given us all a very a renewed appreciation for healthcare workers and the work that they do. Um, do. Do you think that this new awareness will translate into policy action to improve resilience of healthcare systems? And if so, how can we support this process? Thank you, Corinne. Yeah, so we'd all wish that that, that, that would be the case, that, in, that indeed this um, heightened appreciation, um, you hear everybody saying, oh, you know, the health workers, they are front line, and, and there's all this um, positive energy about uh, wanting to, pro to protect health workers, to improve their welfare, to, to build resilience in the system, to build stronger healthcare systems. 
and, and all manner of things that people are bringing. And so, yeah, you would wish that indeed all this would energy would trans, translate into policy and into real change. Um, I say you would wish because I think that we shouldn't take it for granted. I think there's a real danger here and, and we in road safety are used to this. I think everybody has had this experience in their country where there's been a horrendous traffic crash and you know 20 people have been killed or a very important person in the country has died on the road and this outpouring of rage will say this must change absolutely tomorrow and and governments are really good at this and so they'll say oh there's definitely going to be change and then once the acute sense of loss of tragedy wears off there's, tend there's a tendency for things to revert back to where they were now give i mean granted this is a pandemic so this is way bigger than anything else that we've experienced and so we would hope that 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 thing will actually last and that it will translate into policy but as i said i think we shouldn't take it for granted i think we need to be strategic we need to plan to ushering that is that we we would like to see to to direct those changes and to ensure that this um energy is not lost i mean in many ways oh you know we, this has really been god sent that you the you know fate has handed us this and it's an opportunity and i hear this in uganda and i hear it in many other places and I, I would like for that to be the case. But I think the reason why a lot of times we don't harness this is because we don't plan well and we only grab the very superficial benefits. And I, so I would want to see that we, that we look at all of these things that are even more upstream, that we look at how, this, at, at how health systems are, are perceived and, and what people think they exist to do. I think in many people's minds, a health system is, you know, people come to a hospital when they are sick. They don't really think about the things that keep people healthy and out of hospitals and the things that we need to invest in to make sure that we reduce the burden on hospitals. Corinne did say that, you know, if, we, if there wasn't the lockdown, we would collapse health systems. I think there are many people who don't quite understand that. It may be in that way saying, that hospitals can be completely outstripped of their capacity and that there's no that they think they can do they're overwhelmed. And oddly enough, I think in many countries for several reasons, and I don't think anybody has those answers in Africa. We haven't had the kind of catastrophic um, you know, the numbers that we see happening in the West. And so I fear that this could would very easily translate into a sense of, oh, we've actually managed, we, we are coping. Uh, and so I, I would want to say, how do we ensure that this doesn't slip through our fingers? Is that we make good partnerships? Is that we begin looking at all those pieces? We look at how, how these health systems are conceived. What do, we, what, what do we want for them to do for us? And how can they deliver on those things? And that's where those pillars that I talked about come in. You know, what's the governance? What's the finance? And how, to what extent are they financed so that we can expect, you know, the kind of things that we'd like to see from them? What are the kind of healthcare needs, the healthcare worker needs? How we recruit them, train them, sustain them, and retain them in the system? Um, and, and all of those things. So I think we need to to think um, strategically, to form those partnerships that, that will help us so that we are not going in alone. Um, and some of these are more natural. Uh, for instance, when people think about acute care systems, when we in road safety think about acute care, acute trauma care, we're thinking road traffic crash, post crash injury. But actually it's the same system that is serving uh, in many places, children that have malaria and anemia and that are at risk dying in the next two hours unless they get a transfusion and something else, or an obstructed labor. So, so there are partnerships that we can form so that when we call for, for more uh, resourcing, 
for more resilience to be built in these systems, for prevention so that these systems are not um, overwhelmed, that there's going to be, there are going to be more voices and, and that we're going like to succeed long term. Thank you. Thanks, Olive. Um, uh, Priyanka, you're, you're involved in the, sort of the health systems response at the WHO. Um, could you share with us yeah. an example or two of countries that have coped particularly well um, or unexpectedly well and what lessons we could learn from them in terms of preparedness, uh, developing resilience and how perhaps this can be applied to our road, work in road safety? Sure. Um, you know, I think, I think one thing that we all have to really take into account as we're having these discussions is that COVID-19 has, has affected every person everywhere. And it has really shown us when it comes to, to health systems work that even this, what, we, what we may have thought of as the strongest health systems in the world have been deeply affected and they have been extremely overwhelmed. Um, and that has been, you know, it's been a, a quite a surprise to, to many of us. And many of us have felt like, you know, we've, we've been talking about preparedness and resilience and building health systems for, for a very long time. And, um, and, you know, and how could this, how could we possibly be in this situation when this is what we've been doing? But it's really shown us that something like, something like COVID-19 has, it can take the whole world by storm and really show us, you know, how strong it really is our health systems. And we've, um, we've heard, you know, we've seen the examples from Italy, from Spain, um, from France, some of, the, some of the really hardest hit parts of any of the United States and New York, um, some of the really hardest hit hits part of the world. Um, and then, you know, and then taking lessons from, from some of the colleagues in, in, for example, say Korea, or even some parts of China, um, where, you know the 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 really the some of the only places right now that have truly mitigated and contained the response and contained the contained the outbreak, and so we're we're it's an ever evolving area of work, um, and we're constantly learning. We're constantly on the phone with with different countries and regions and understanding what works in some places and what doesn't. And it's extremely what we've learned so far is is extremely context specific in the sense of you know, the population size and also the, the epidemiologic scenario of where COVID is in that area. So what is the transmission of COVID in your particular area of work, uh, in where you live? Um, and that's, that's sort of been how we've, how we've begun to understand what can possibly be done in where you live. Um, but it's, um, you know, there's, so we define, we define the transmission as the four C's as we call them, right? So there's a community transmission, which is when in most parts of the world is community transmission, but there are areas where there are clusters of cases or sporadic cases and almost none where there's no cases. Um, but for parts of the world where there are clusters or sporadic cases, um, you know, we're, we're advising countries and helping them determine what sorts of strategies can they put into place now so that they don't end up in a place that has community transmission and, and where they, the quote unquote, the health system collapses. Um, and we've, you know, we're, what we're learning is that it's, it's really an all of society approach. It's not only about uh, the epidemiology or about the virology or about, you know, the clinical care for the patient, um, you know, the, in, in just a public health response. This is, a financial response. It's a full government response. Society has to take has to take their own responsibility for their actions, and we're seeing that, and we're learning that as 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 people and countries face the uh, face the repercussions of having people in quarantine or in uh, in in home isolation for such a long time. I think some of us are feeling that ourselves even now, um, and so I think. What we've what we've gathered over the last several weeks has been, uh, you know, the the way that we can really bring this to a halt is for everyone to get on board and understand that it takes all of us. It takes a whole world to bring this one virus to a stop, and um, you know, and there's in 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 what is what to do and how to manage this. It's you know, we're all learning and and sharing stories together. It's 
Um, but it, you know, it's a it's so relevant to what's happening in your area, in the politics of the area, and the finances, and what we really want to focus on, apart from you know from not only from stopping the the pandemic itself, but to ensure that people who still need all the other care that needs that needs to happen, you know, different service delivery models for delivering insulin medication for a diabetics or helping women who are need to give birth safely, still give birth safely in this time. Um, so how, how can we help uh, deliver the same type of care that is needed in a non, you know, pre-COVID um, in, in this time and, and coming up with, with innovations and really using some of that, uh, some of those modalities um, to harness the power of, of prevention and promotion as we're talking about now. You know, primary care doctors, when you when a child goes and, and has their regular well, well visit, a lot of times will have, um, have you know, their, their, they'll have their regular set of questionnaires to check, you know, safety and do you wear your seatbelt when you, when you sit in the car, right? This is a question that a lot of primary care doctors will ask at their regular visits. And it's, it's, a, it's an important time now to leverage some of these different modalities for delivering care where they can be more effective and you can have more time to, to, to dedicate to a patient that you're seeing via telemedicine and really harness that time to get into some of these other promotion and prevention, uh, model, uh, other prevention and promotion um, advocacy now before COVID, you know, either, you know, but then you go back to your regular life and start driving a car again. Um, and now is a time where you can start to think about how, what can I do to prevent another injury so that I don't have to go to the hospital. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that that's another thing that's coming up now is patients are extremely scared to go seek care. And, um, you know, we, we want to ensure them that they know that their health system is there for them and it, what can it provide? You know, it's getting into what Olive was just saying. Do, what do they want it to provide? What should it provide? Um, and so it's a, it, this is the time now where people are, are really stationed in one place almost uh, everywhere and where we can really engage them in under, for, and help them understand what is the health system there for? What, can, what should it be there for? And, you know, health is at the is at the forefront of everyone's mind right now because everyone's worried about COVID. And, and uh, so I think a lot of people are focusing on their health more than they probably would pre-COVID. Um, so we really have this great opportunity to show them and to, and to engage with them about uh, what we can do now to help them in the future so they don't suffer from COVID, but they also don't suffer from something like injury. Thanks. Yeah, certainly a very good opportunity for reminding people about their health. And I think people, like you say, people are um, caring more about their health. I mean, they, you know, people are even exercising more because they don't want to get sick. So it's, it all has a knock-on effect. Um, Erkin, um, taking it down to perhaps more of a, a local or sort of a national level, um, from your experience, um, what would you say is most needed to improve the resilience um, of the healthcare system in, in Kyrgyzstan um, that can help protect it against from both future pandemics but also other, other health issues, um, particularly road safety, well, road trauma. Thank you, Corinne. Shortly about, uh, uh, if you want to hear about national context, Kyrgyzstan is a uh, six million uh, population, middle income post-Soviet country, mountaineers, 90% of territory is uh, up to 4,000, 5,000 meter mountains with the glaciers on top. Uh, about the health system, uh, you know, uh, despite uh, the, the fight against infection, uh, communicable diseases, uh, I mean the vaccination, uh, all sorts of public health measures led to a significant reduction of its, uh, the cause of mortality. Uh, we can see that it is uh, absolutely necessary to have a full potential of health system to combat uh, such uh, sudden outbreaks like a COVID-19. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, fortunately, uh, 
we inherited a good, I would say, strong sanitary epidemiological system from the Soviet time, and uh, we uh, we introduced the quarantine regime and the lockdown people on time, and uh, we have only 12 deaths by now with a thousand infected people. We uh, uh, we could save our health system uh, and it's not overwhelmed. But at the same time, we have, of course, uh, this outbreak is demonstrated the weakest parts. Now the, as a source of infection, we have uh, medical doctors who are infected, who got infected and uh, uh, whole family uh, medicine centers are, uh, for example, closing one, uh, several of them because of the uh, lot of doctors uh, get infected. Uh, another point is that uh, we all see that uh, countries, well-being countries are urgently building new hospitals. Uh, so, Kyrgyz economy is uh, not that strong, so we cannot build a new hospital. Uh, but uh, uh, what the main uh, uh, point I want to say is that when we try to reform or uh, build uh, health systems, we cannot or uh, we should not look uh, too much to be just economically cost-effective system. That was the uh, main purpose uh, of all the reforms in Kyrgyzstan uh, late 20, 30 years. We were trying to shrimp the hospitals to make the system more economically effective. Now these outbreaks uh, demonstrate us that the health system should not be just economically effective, but it has to be ready for such kind of outbreaks. And we need those hospitals, we need those doctors. Now, for example, due to uh, lack of doctors, some of them are getting infected. Uh, we are uh, involving medical students uh, into the hospital. So health system has to be ready in terms of number of hospitals, number of beds, trained personnel with adequate equipment. Uh, so if we say about uh, Kyrgyzstan and the, in general about this uh, COVID-19 measures, uh, countries has to be very careful, do not take unjustified risks and the unjustified restrictions. In different region, it can be it can vary, vary region by region. If in some region, uh, quarantine regime is just enough for another region, we have to do the total lockdown of the people. So we are all learning uh, how to uh, how we can uh, combat with such an uh, out, outbreaks. But uh, one thing is that uh, delivering treatment service. But since we are all uh, public health people here, I, I cannot miss the uh, prevention part. Here uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we have, as I mentioned before, uh, strong Semashka health system with a good epidemiological sanitary hygiene control system. But we are totally missing the system of prevention of non-communicable diseases, including uh, road trauma. Uh, we do not have an institutionalized, stable system of health promotion and education. Uh, even, even medical academy, we are preparing only sanitary hygiene doctors, but not health promoters. And that's, uh, that's why, for example, if we return to the road safety, we have already drafted strategy to reduce the uh, trauma and the death on the roads but it's uh, not approved by the government. We do not have one responsible institute here who will be responsible for reducing the deaths on the roads. You know, the policy system working in one system, 
medical healthcare system is working only with a post crash service. Uh, so that's a weak part of health system in, I think not only in Kyrgyzstan, but probably most of the post-Soviet countries. We have to develop the health promotion, prevention of the NCD, not just infection disease. With infection disease, we are, I would say quite well, 98% uh, of vaccination, and, uh, but prevention of non-communicable diseases changing the behavior, changing the environment towards more healthier uh, environment. That's what syst health system is missing, I would say. That's where uh, we have to put more attention and uh, attract more attention, not just from the politicians, but also from the donor society. Uh, well, well known that the, in public health measures, Doing where the money is, uh, exists. So, if there is a lot of money in HIV TB, uh, there is a measures in countries going on. But if donors do not relocate their attention and the uh, resources to prevention of non-communicable disease, which is the cause of most uh, deaths globally, then there is no no activity, not that activity which uh, could be taken by by society, by NGO, by uh, government, ministries of health, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think um, now during the quarantine regime, of course, uh, road safety problem, not at the political agenda, but, uh, and uh, I would say all other uh, long communicable conditions and disease are not at the political, not on the focus. But uh, COVID will pass, this time will pass and uh, people will realize that uh, we have a lot of other problems. So I would say that uh, prevention of non communicable conditions, that's where we have to also put our attention. That's, uh, uh, I would say, Kyrgyz. Kyrgyz situation in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's a um, situation a lot of us will be facing. Um, how do we influence the donors and policymakers to keep the resilience of health services on the agenda and also invest in prevention? Um, I think we are, we are all aware that you know, road safety and these issues are, are under don't have the attention that perhaps uh, we think that they should. Um, so with this sort of question in mind, um, uh, starting with Olive, um, how do we keep this on the agenda? What can we as an NGO community um, in particular do and how, what sort of, what specific issues do we need to address and, and raise so that it stays where it should be? Thank you, Corinne. Um, yeah, it's been helpful to, to listen to Erkin and to, to hear what's happening in Kazakhstan. So one thing that I'd like to flag for us and that I think um, is in many ways at the heart of what's going on in many countries right now is the, is the question of equity. And even when we think about what we'd like to see happen post COVID-19 pandemic, or what's even gone wrong in our response. We, we quickly realize that many of these problems have arisen because we haven't really uh, taken the trouble to build equitable systems. Um, I'll give you an example of Uganda. So, we, as I said, we, we don't have any, as far as we are aware, we don't have any official deaths from COVID-19. Uh, we don't know, we, we, we believe that nobody in, in this country has died of the virus itself. But as I said earlier, many people are dying because they can't access care, or because they, they can't access food, because babies are malnourished, and so on and so forth. And so what might make 
managing a pandemic difficult might then turn out to be that people can't really adhere to the guidelines that they're given because they don't have food, because they, even if they'd very much wish to stay home, to stay away from the markets, they really have to go out every day to forage for food. And now that, that same problem with equity is going to rear its head when we come out of the pandemic and we say we'd like to see health systems strengthened because guess what? We've had how absolutely critical it is to have intensive care unit beds. And so Uganda, which started off having, you know, 50 ICU beds for the entire 41 million people, might suddenly want to, to, to you know, compete with Spain, meaning that we put a lot of our resources into very high-end care. And yet the bulk of the people that are dying in Uganda are not necessarily dying because they couldn't get into an ICU bed. They're probably dying because they couldn't get very basic resuscitation when they came into the ER, or they couldn't even get into the hospital. They just needed transfer hospital. So I think we need to, to keep equity central to understand that with these health systems, in order to be resilient, they actually need to take care of everyone because somebody in the slums is moving around looking for food, but also moving around spreading the virus, then, well, maybe we should have fed them better so they would stay in one place. So actually taking care of helps us to take care of everyone. Taking care of the vulnerable helps us to take care of. So I think that we need to watch out that when we begin making demands for these changes to improve care systems, that we are actually thinking about improving them for everyone and beginning on, on the ground level going up so that everyone has basic services before we can aspire to have, you know, top services for only a few people in the country. Um, and, and so I think we need to look at those vulnerabilities, we need to look at rural versus urban. Are we setting up systems that can only serve those that, that work and live in the big cities, but in the villages, they really have no access to care uh, of any sort or of a reasonable sort. Uh, so I think when we begin looking at it like that, we'll get support even from those corners from which we might not have expected support. And I know that sometimes it's a hard sell in countries such as our own, where the people that have the power access those stop note services and they want them in the city. And so they really don't have in on their radar the little kids that are in the in the villages because they couldn't get their mothers couldn't get to a hospital in time for a transfusion. So I, th I think we need to keep that in mind. The other thing that I think we can be better at doing is, is looking at data, is finding the data that we need to be able to make these cases so that we can actually show where the, the gaps are and where the gains would be and where we would actually make savings if we were able to put in these changes. A lot of times we can't make a case because we don't have the data. So I think that's one other thing that we can do. And we can, we can have partnerships. So not everybody's job is around data, but I think if in, you know, people that are in advocacy can have good partnerships with those that are in academia and research, then we are a stronger force and we have both, you know, we have all of the skill sets, we have what we need to make these cases. Um, um, Erkin talked about the, the economy. And I think in some ways this is going to, to be the, the deal breaker because everybody's going to say, oh, the economy has crashed. So we absolutely have to fix the economy. And in fixing the economy, there could be the danger that a few things get forgotten about because then now we start thinking about um, maybe manufacturing um, and maybe we get right back into um, congestion, into not having um, places for people that, that don't have big motor vehicles and so on. So uh, I think that when we think economic growth or economic 
revamping the economy, I think we also need to look at it a little more critically and say, so which components are we putting forward and how are they going to impact things like uh, health services? In Uganda, there's the belief for some, and I think it, it might be in other countries as well, that health and education are consumptive sectors, that they are not revenue generating, that actually when you put money in health or in education, these sectors just take the money, but they really don't generate revenue. And I think this has been going on for some time until you know, people just think they don't even question it. But I think the pandemic has showed us that health, if we don't take care of it, has the capacity to collapse the entire economy. And that unless we can save people's health, then, then there's not going to be a population that can generate revenue. And I think we need to keep that front and center that we need healthy populations in order to have healthy economies. I don't know how better we can put this, but I think we need to keep this in the faces of these discussions, the central to these discussions that we need strong healthcare systems, we need healthy populations in order for there to be healthy economies. Thanks, Olive. Um, I suppose we're running out of time. Um, we might just have one, one last question um, uh, for Priyanka that is sort of coming up a bit in, in the chat and has also come up in a few of the questions submitted in advance. Um, and it's, it's around sort of how, how we as a road safety community can engage um, on a bigger level um, with WHO and um, ministries of health um, to ensure that um, you know these our issues are, are being heard and that you know investment and funding is going going into the right place yeah I'm happy to answer that I've seen a few of those come through on the chat as well and um, and you know it's not a it's not a new question over the last several weeks we've had many of our partners who are engaged in in health systems work ask us the same thing and I think we again using this as much as we possibly can using COVID for for an opportunity to bring this to the forefront of policymakers' minds and 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 all of everyone who's who's involved in the health system. Um, one thing that I think has really come out is that um, when it comes to you know this was this is something that also um, Dr. Erkin and Dr. Olive also mentioned is when it comes to caring for um, and you know going back to po to pillar five. So when it comes to caring for a, a, a victim of a road crash, um, you know the when you know pre-hospital providers may come to the site of the crash, or they may not. The, the victim may be taken directly to a facility, but that that initial first care that that frontline care that is provided to the patient, whether they're a victim of a road crash or whether they're a victim of severe COVID, is the same systematic approach that is applied. And I think that has come up for us as a clinicians and our clinical work time and time again. You know, when we're, we're advising clinicians on how to care for COVID patients, it, you know, the first thing that we all do is check airway, breathing, circulation, disability. We go through our basic emergency care. And that is, that is the same thing that we would do for a road traffic patient. And it's the same thing we do for, for a COVID patient. And similarly, after, you know, if, as Olive was saying, you know, if, if a patient ends up needing an intensive care, which 95% of patients don't, out of what we know about it, the epidemiology so far for COVID, 80% of them are mild or moderate, 15% of them, approximately 15% of them are severe and require oxygen. And only 5% of them really require intensive care with mechanical ventilation. And if we, you know, a lot of, a lot of the investment that has been, a lot of the, um, the, the, the asks for us have come to how do we help provide ventilators? How can we help support building ICUs? And, you know, that's, that's very much needed. It's a really great, especially if you're in a country like Spain or Italy where the numbers are extremely high then that is definitely something that is needed. But if you're in a country like Uganda, as all of us saying, where that's not the majority of the patients, there's not that many patients or, you know, in, in other countries, um, 
maybe maybe some some other countries and that where the colleagues who are on the call now are where intensive care is not the priority at the moment. We're really worried about the other 95% of patients. What can we do to help build their capacities? Is is if we if we want to talk about what what can countries and NGOs and partners really help us with and helping build health systems right now is building up that frontline training. And that is going to help leverage us for the road safety community. It's going to leverage us for COVID. And it will also help you know, with the trainings and, and, um, and building up the capacity for everything else that may present to a health system. So that is definitely something that, you know, particularly our work in Pillar 5 and post-crash response can really partner really well with. And, and I think what you all can do as NGOs is partner up with the, the, the clinical networks that you have, so the, the professional societies um, and other donors, and really get them to see that clinical care for COVID is not that different than clinical care for many and many other diseases. You know, it's, a, it's more about the, the isolation and about the epidemiology and about keeping people safe from the transmission of the virus. But in terms of the actual management of the patient, it's, it's a basic emergency care plus intensive care when needed. And so I think um, helping, helping uh, countries and ministries and partners understand that and partnering with them to help deliver oxygen and help deliver basic emergency care can go a long, long way. So that is something that you know, we have tools for. WHO has the basic emergency care tools and triage tools and all sorts of things. And you know, there's other many partners who have developed um, training materials and, and helping get that word out now and building up the, the networks. And as Erkan was saying, medical students are now being put into the front line and, and others who just need that upscale training as, as our refresher trainings and how to deal with the front line emergencies. So that is something that I think can be really, really useful right now. Thank you. That's a good way to round up. Um, however, I do feel we could talk about this for a lot longer. I know there are loads more questions from the participants that we haven't been able to cover. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be opportunity to discuss this a lot more in, in the future, um, in the coming months and, and beyond that. Um, so unfortunately, we have to so let's wind up there. Um, I want to say thank you to the speakers for joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Um, they were very valuable, um, all very interesting. Um, I want to just, if each of you could just give a quick sort of 10 to 30 second roundup of your key takeaways or what we can take away from this session um, before we hand back over to Lotte to, to give some more, some of the technical. Uh, instructions. Olive, do you want to begin? Hello, can you hear? I talk too long, so I'd like to give my, my colleagues an opportunity to my time. <laughs> okay, Erkin, do you want to begin? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just uh, to finish our long conversation, I think the COVID is, has a, uh, quite some positive consequences as well. You know, in Kyrgyzstan, the ecology is much better, air is much cleaner. Deaths on the road and trauma is reduced dramatically, right? People are uh, due to quarantine, do not using the cars anymore. Uh, I noticed that here even people start to use more bicycles. You know, we. We can use this time uh, and promote healthier transportation, uh, promote the less uh, usage of the uh, cars on the street. People understood that they actually, they don't need to move so much here and there by car, you know. <laughs> and uh, the main point, of course, since uh, big attention for the health system in general, we could use this to to raise attention and the resources to make the health system stronger to, for post-crash reaction, right? Uh, for example, here in Kyrgyzstan, uh, society is uh, collecting money and buying the ambulance car to the hospitals now, where it was not enough. I'm not talking about the big uh, charities. Uh, so people want to support health system 
business want to support health system. So th there is a time and I think good moment to put attention of those people who want to support health system to the right direction, in, including uh, not just intensive care units, but also the trauma units, uh, not just treating, but prevention of, uh, as I mentioned before. So I think that, that there is a, some uh, good consequences from COVID as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ekin. Priyanka, do you have any final words? I'll just say one last thing, and I've said it before, but I think it's worth repeating. I think this time uh, for, for all the other disease programs and all of the other um, advocacy groups that you feel like they're very stuck in this time and don't know what to do because of X, Y, Z reason and COVID has put a stop to every, everything else. Um, but I, I really see this as a great opportunity to, to use the fact that people are really thinking about health as a forefront of their mind right now. And, um, and there's so much overlap with how co the COVID response is working and how we need to continue working with all of the other disease programs, including injury. Um, and, and really try to remember that, uh, you know, this eventually the COVID will finish and it will, we will, we'll get a handle on it. And, and you know, the, and people will get back on the road and there will be lots, uh, lots of work that will come our way. And in, instead of waiting until then, I think this can be a really great time to bring, uh, bring out the promotion prevention and the care for the injured. Uh, to the forefront of people's minds and to our minds and, and really leverage what is happening in COVID uh, to care for, for those patients as well. So um, really, I think this is, this is a great opportunity to, to keep working and realize that this is, this is going to come to an end and our, our work will continue. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to, to all the speakers. Um, for me, the, the, the big word that's jumped out of today's session is partnerships. We're going to have to work with other people. Um, we're going to have to work more with the healthcare system, um, healthcare professionals, um, those involved, and because we do all have the same overall mission. Um, and, and to get there, we're going to have to start reaching out. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Lotte now um, to say goodbye. Just thank you again to to the panelists. Thank you to um, everyone who's joined as an attendee. And also thank you to Lotte and the Global Alliance for organizing the session. It's been very interesting. Thank you very much. The Olive, Erkin and, and Priyanka, thank you very much. And Corinne, thank you very much for, um, for your time here. I think one of the things I took away was definitely the, uh, the prevention part. And, um, but also around the, uh, how we can piggyback on, on different areas. Um, and the opportunities that actually we have to look at, uh, we have to see this COVID-19 as an opportunity for us to embark on partnerships with a lot of other areas. You mentioned now, we talked about the health system, but um, Olive, you also talked about the poverty aspects and the um, equity uh, areas, which I think is quite, um, is quite interesting. Um, just, uh, this is the third of our Alliance live sessions. And um, next week we have one on inequalities, um, COVID-19 uh, road safety and inequality, which, where I'm sure we'll talk much more about what you, what you mentioned, Olive. Um, following that, we'll have one on youth. Uh, we have one lined up on emission environment, and then we have one on gender. So this is keep, um, keep, keep following our communication on these things because these are are going to also to be very interesting and and what what I really find uh, quite striking is that you're actually touching on some of these areas when we're talking about health systems we are, we're, we're also talking about for example the gender as, aspect and the the uh, emission you mentioned Erkin and um, inequality so um, this is the idea with these sessions that we look at what what uh, the interconnectedness of road safety with a lot of other areas so um, Thank you very much for your time here. All, this, uh, all these webinars, all these uh, are, are, are uh, recorded and you can, uh, we'll put them up on our website as soon as we're done here. So anyone who wants to listen back or there's some of the great points that were made that you would like to, to hear one more time, you, you, can, you can do that. They will sit on our website. Um, and um, other than that, thank you very much for your time and thank you for a very interesting session. Corinne, thank you for moderating and Franka, Erkin and, and Olive, thanks for your time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you very much for, for
thanks for, to, to all the participants who joined, joined us. Uh, thanks for your time. Yes. Thank you for participants. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's good. Bye.